Check one, two. Check one, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Check one, two. Check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yep. Check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yep. That's grand. Thanks.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for coming to uh, the Talbot Hotel this morning, and we welcome also those at home on uh, the live webinar for this uh, BlackRock uh, Clinic Study Morning. Um, this morning we have sp four speakers, uh, Professor Karen Redmond, uh, Dr. Nicola Ambrose, uh, Mr. Niall Davis, and Dr. Peter Wittes-Walsh. Uh, the format is going to be that uh, each of the speakers um, will uh, speak individually uh, about their chosen topic. Um, we will have questions at the end of each speaker, um, is especially to facilitate the webinar, it's important that we don't have questions in the middle of each speaker because it'll be just too difficult to coordinate and hear from home. Um, and we just ask those people in the audience here, if you do have a question, we need to get the microphone to you in order for everything to be heard at home on the webinar, so that'll be just important. Um, so the first speaker is Professor Karen Redmond. Um, she is a consultant in uh, thoracic and lung transplant surgery. Um, and she's going to speak today on um, a very interesting uh, uh, topic, which is lung volume reduction in COPD. Um, and one of her techniques for, for this is uh, using the uh, famed Da Vinci robot. Uh, with this uh, procedure, um, uh, she is able to, in people with uh, COPD that hasn't responded uh, <laughs> otherwise, she can actually improve FEV1 by 20 to 30 percent. Anyway, she knows a lot more about that than I, so I will let her uh, commence her talk now, if that's okay. Uh, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. So, technology and advances in technology, I can't keep up. There's so much going on out there. And, um, apologies, sorry, there's so much going on out there. Uh, it's important that we keep current. Uh, to be an advocate for the patient. And I started thinking about endobronchial valves and robotic lung volume reduction because patients were coming to me with COPD for consideration of lung transplant. And they were incredibly debilitated with a terrible quality of life and all the psychology that is aligned to somebody with a chronic illness. And I felt that there might be something that we could offer uh, as a bridge to transplant <coughs> or assassination therapy, um, especially when there's so few donor organs out there that we can offer. So COPD is quite a prevalent condition and I'm sure this is what happens to you on a daily basis in patients coming to see you in clinic with infective exacerbations. In fact, over half a million people in Ireland have this condition. A lot of people don't even realise they have this condition. Quite you know, frequently it's smoking related or they may have a congenital condition such as alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And there was a recent um, a paper put in to the College of Physicians, a statement, a physician statement around COPD just this month. And you can see in Ireland, over 30 people per 100,000 of the population are dying with COPD-related disease. In fact, as far back as 2010, it was the third leasing, leading cause of death. So it's, it's an am amazing uh, medical and economic burden on society, not just on the patient, but on next of kin, extended family, and coping with this on a regular basis. There is a phenotype for people with COPD. And recently I had a gentleman who came to see me uh, and was in the induction room before he went into theatre. An elderly gentleman. He lives at home, he's 80, with his wife, who's 84, who's his main carer. He had a pressure area because he struggled to get out of bed because he was so distant <coughs> from his COPD. He could barely talk, he could barely eat, and he was incredibly grumpy in the induction room. And he was, in fact, purse reading with me. So as we chatted along, I said, I'm, I, I don't know if I can get you through this, but I'm going to offer you endobronchial valves today to see if I can improve your quality of life. And the following day, he was walking on the ward. And that's the difference that valves, for example, can offer people with COPD. It is the best hidden secret out there. Because very few people offer this in Ireland, I almost feel that if I get the message out, I'll be inundated with work. People who have COPD have obstructive lung disease. And the problem is they have a lot of air trapping and they're hyperinflated, they have a barrel-shaped chest and their diaphragm is pushed right down so they can't get a good cough mechanism. So when they start building up a bit of phlegm, they can't get the phlegm up and they get these infective exacerbations. But the biggest problem with COPD is just breathing. And the, they will, when they're sitting talking to you, they may be okay, but when they start to walk, they're so breathless they can do very little. And they will equate it to like breathing in and out of a straw. So as we exercise, we'll take a good deep breath in and out, 
And for a patient to exercise with COPD, it's they just can't get the airflow in and out. We refer, to, we refer to it as the air hunger. And that is the problem, the biggest problem with COPD. The decreased activity, reduced exercise, further deconditioning, and the risk of mortality. But there are a spectrum of treatments. COPD is a complex disease, I'll talk about it a little bit more. We have medical management and all the different phenotypes of patients with COPD. Pulmonary rehabilitation, this is a I, I would I cannot st more strongly um, stress the importance of pulmonary rehabilitation. And if you can get into your local programs, great. Or I will say Noel McCaffrey, in, who's in Santry, um, offers uh, assessments and home exercise programs. From there, we can offer endobronchial valve therapy in a certain cohort of patients, lung volume reduction, or lung transplant. We have a COPD MDT, and we have, um, it's important that we understand the phenotypes out there. We want a specialist who has an interest in COPD to understand the benefits of pulmonary rehab. These patients might have a component of sleep apnea, bronchiectasis, uh, pulmonary hypertension. They need to understand the importance of palliative care in some cases, and what interventional bronchoscopy or surgical options are out there. And about a third of patients will go down the route of medical therapy and pulmonary rehab. A third will go for lung volume reduction, and roughly a third will go on to transplant. The medical profession out there don't quite understand the role of what we refer to as lung volume reduction. And with lung volume reduction surgery, um, there was a, an opinion um, article put out there recently that up to 50% of people were unsure what it was. And up to 70% of people had no access to a service that could offer lung volume reduction. And when you look at the patient out there, they will go online, and the, the Wikipedia is something that I look at a lot because I want to understand what the patients are looking at before they come and see me. What do they understand about lung volume reduction? And online with Wikipedia will say that you're removing hyperperfused or malperfused parts of the lung that has significant air trapping. That's not really contributing very much except splinting the chest open and splinting the diaphragm down. And once you take that target away, it allows the better lung to breathe a little bit better. And instead of when they breathe out that they have very high residual volumes, after lung volume reduction, when they breathe out, they can really breathe out, they can really get the airflow out, the residual volumes drop down. And the Cochrane database will show that if you can offer lung volume reduction surgery to people above medical therapy, they will live longer. They live longer with a better quality of life, and that's all we're trying to offer these people. And so the people who may benefit from lung volume reduction will be very symptomatic. They've had all their medical therapy and vaccinations, They've gone through smoking cessation and nutritional support. They have their oxygen. They're in pulmonary rehab. Uh, they will be hyperinflated. And so the residual volume is usually about a, over 180% predicted. And then we look at their CT. And you can see here a very hyperinflated right upper lobe. And in this particular person, they have what's referred to as complete fissures. So there's no communication between the right upper lobe, the middle, or the lower lobe. And if you look at the right upper lobe here, if we can valve it through the airway, and collapse it down, it makes a lot more room for these two lobes to work and for the diaphragm to move up and down. And we have a performer, if people are interested, it's in, on the chairs. So with the endobronchial techniques, we often consider a, condition, a thing called valves. And there's a best practice paper out there for valves, and it will show that the FEV1, especially with the recent Liberate trial, will improve by over 20%. But you get a better quality of life. That's what it's, you know, looking at the data. It's the quality of life surveys that's most important. And when people come, they have a CT, and we do what's referred to as a Stratix report. And on the Stratix report, we can see that the black area is very bad lung on the emphysema index. It's really bad. And there's a complete fissure based on review. And then if we look at the numbers, we can tell that if we valve the left upper lobe, that left upper lobe should collapse down and they should get a lung volume reduction effect. We do a perfusion scan, a radioactive scan, and we can see the paucity of perfusion in the upper lobes, which means if I take that away, I'm not going to impact too much on gas exchange. When we look at the, the complete fissure is important because if we valve the left upper lobe, we want it to collapse down, but if there's any communication between the left upper lobe and the left lower lobe, airflow will go down, and come back up and reinflate the left upper lobe. So I'm going to put valves in. They cost about 7K. I want to make sure that they're going to work. 
This is done under general anaesthetic. There is um, really minimum cutting involved, bar putting a small little chest drain in on that side to, to protect the area to prevent a pneumothorax. The area is sized and you can see a valve being deployed here. So you have an idea of what it's about. It probably takes maybe about 30 minutes, 45 minutes max in theater. I have a very good anesthetist and trained intensivist doing all of my cases. And as you can see here with the valve in, there's a duct bill mechanism. So airflow cannot get in, but it allows any phlegm to get back out. And here's an example of a letter that I received from a patient who had valves put in. And it's all the basic things. I can hold a conversation. I really forgot how important that is. Um, I used to think it was all about nutritional support for people with COPD. Apologies. But in fact, the biggest thing people say to me is I can talk to people. I can talk to people on the phone. People can hear what I have to say. Something as simple as that, talking and eating, you know, to have that quality of life back. We decided that during the valves, when we take down the lobe and the remaining lobe reinflates to fill the space, sometimes it can pop a pneumothorax. So for me, I will put a small little drain in to prevent a pneumothorax in the post-operative setting. And with that in mind, I've had no mortalities on any of my patients who have had valves put in. This is a lady who came to me for consideration of a lung transplant. She's in her late 50s. And um, there's a longevity issue with lung transplantation. You might get six or seven years. She's grandchildren. She wants to live a very long time to see her kids grow up. And you can see here on her, on her chest x-ray, in particular, she's got almost a bullous component causing a compression effect on her lungs. And after the valves go in, you can see that that area is gone and the diaphragm has come up. And she's going to say a few words now. Oh, just the volume. We still have no mobility or anything, and now I'm only on two litres, and I'm able to get around, plus I'm able to dry my hair and straighten it without any oxygen. Like, I couldn't take it off at all. Mm -hmm. And now I can, like, even making the bed the other day after doing four kilometers, I thought I was doing good. It usually take me two hours to change it. And I asked somebody just to help me with the cover. Mm -hmm. And when he came up, he said to me, you're doing good. And I said, yeah. And he said, the oxygen is disconnected. Mm. So Could I didn't even have it on and I didn't notice. And do you think you can walk further? Can you do more from an exercise perspective mm -hmm. yet? I know it's early days. Definitely on the treadmill and that, but I haven't been out until I get this out because I was okay. afraid of infection. I know the drains has come out. So back yeah. to the pummy rehab and we'll see how you're getting on. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And thanks, mm -hmm. thanks for letting us know. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, that's just a small example of the small things that make a difference. That lady had just had her chest drain taken out two minutes beforehand, and I asked her would she say a few words today for the audience so people would have an understanding of what happens. So we, we do bridge people, or it's destination therapy. But on the occasions where there is collateral ventilation and the valves aren't going to work, then I will consider surgical or robotic lung volume reduction. And surgical lung volume reduction has been around for a very long time published in the New York, New York Times in the last century. And there was a trial called the NET trial, which you might be familiar with, which happened in the 1990s. But the NET trial in the 1990s, the data is very outdated. So traditionally people would have said, oh, upper lobe predominant emphysema um, in people who have a low exercise tolerance. LVR works for people with homogenous emphysema. As long as you're hyperinflated and you've got air trapping and you can't breathe in and out, by doing a lung volume reduction on those people, they will see clinical benefit. The options are a keyhole, either VATS or in BlackRock, we have an XI robot. And the robot has gone through many different um, technology advancements. And the advantages for the surgeon is that I can have 360 degree movement. I'm not caught by the chest wall. It filters out my caffeine tremor from the morning. Uh, and it gives me a lot of precise um, activity. For the patients, lung volume reduction through the robot is very important because instead of levering off the chest wall and causing intercostal nerve discomfort, I go through and everything is done on the inside. And I can really see things very well. I imagine it like a little Lego man 
in the middle of the test because I'm right up on top of the pathology and what I need to do. And the quality of the imaging is amazing. You know, it's like being at the cinema uh, working away compared to the traditional ways of doing things years ago. And here's an example of somebody that I did on the XI robot in Black Rock, the 71-year-old male ex-smoker, severe COPD, so his FEV1 was 0.68 of a litre. I did a lady last week that was 0.49 of a litre. That's how long, low their lung reserve is. Uh, often I will do people with DLCOs in the, in the low 20s or the teens. His residual volume was 257%. This is not uncommon in these people. Uh, and he was dyspnea, a level grade four. He had a bit of mo moderate pulmonary hypertension at this point, so it was impacting on his cardiac reserve. I bronched him, I did a balloon assessment, I checked to see if I could put valves in, but unfortunately he had collateral ventilation, so the valves wouldn't work. And at the time, I sent off a lavage and I treated any bugs that might have been down there. He came to theatre, and my anaesthetist, first of all, because we put little drains in on the side, we don't use epidurals anymore or put people into the high dependency unit or put them on noradrenaline with urinary catheters. They get local blocks. So th the level of what we do has changed so much. We're very much minimally invasive, enhanced recovery after surgery. They'll have a bike at the end of the bed. We expect them to be cycling that day or the following day. And as you can see here, the local anaesthetic is going in under the serratus muscle. And then we put the ports in. And I'm here with my um, nurse, surgical nurse practitioner who's got 15 years experience in BlackRock. The team are phenomenal. And that's what makes a difference. You know, good surgery and the right patients give you good outcomes and keeps everybody happy. And that's what you're expecting. And you can see the ports going in. What's great about the XI is that I've got fluorescence. So I put a fluorescent dye through and it shows me how the lungs are being perfused. You can see how hyperinflated the lungs are, even though we're on single lung ventilation. With CO2 insufflation in the field, there's a lot of air trapping. The lingula here has actually been quite well perfused. But if you look higher up, you will see that there's very little blood supply getting to the upper part of the lobe. And that's the area to take away. And then we staple it away. It's as simple as that. So I say to people, if I can do a valve, it would be great. Because valves, there's a 0% mortality rate. Uh, with valves, if you do not get the result that you're looking for, I can always take them out and bring you back to your baseline. With surgery, there is a 6% mortality rate at 30 days, because these people are end stage. I'll still get the same FEV1 improvement, but once the lung is out, I can't put it back in. So I will always triage to valves first if possible and move up to robotic lung volume reduction. Afterwards, the, you may have seen this in the community with some of my patients, they may have a drain in attached to a small bag, a Portex valve bag. This is a valve, it's a one-way system. So airflow can come out, but no airflow can go back in. And they can tip any fluid or any air out of the bag here. This was initially designed for the war field, you know, with a major trauma, stick a chest drain in, it makes them ambulatory and they come off the field. So we now use this routine. I'd say 20, 30% of my patients go home with drains and attached to Portex valve bags because they're better off at home. They mobilize more, they shower, they make their own cup of tea, they're away from any infection issues. Uh, from a mentality point of view, they feel they're on the mend, now that they've been discharged. And so their ability to rehab and recover is quicker. And we, we, we pay close attention to them in the community. This is one of my gentlemen with a little bike at the end of the bed following his lung volume reduction. And we have a physio program in Black Rock on the ward with a gym, a designated physios looking after these patients. And, and it's the attention to detail. That's how these people do well. And we triage them uh, to different pulmonary rehab um, um, settings, uh, whether it's in the gym or in the community. And I'm still trying to learn on the job. Um, I've got a PhD working out of uh, DCU with the sports medicine group where we're looking at the role of virtual rehab. People will now be cycling on their bike at home, hanging out with their mates, uh, like my 15-year-old son on Fortnite. Uh, and the robot is going from two or three ports down to one. This is called the Uniport. It's now working out of California. And you can see you have one camera and three arms to work out out of a single incision. So moving forward, we won't have to worry about the intercostal nerve because we'll be doing everything subsifoid. And um, again, it'll reduce morbidity and improve outcomes. 
So I hope this gives you an idea of what we're trying to do at the Blackheart Clinic to, to make a difference to people's lives. And um, for the COPD population in particular, I think that we have something to offer. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. That was a really, really interesting talk. Um, can I just start by asking you, um, uh, how long do patients actually end up staying in after a valve's procedure? Um, with the valve, uh, once the valves go in, um, I, send, I can send them home the following day with the drain, oh, yeah. and I take the drain out in clinic a week later. A week later, okay. And, uh, for the and the results are almost immediate. Almost immediate, so they're mm. actually going home totally well, and after they get the drain out, they're completely back to, back to well, much better than they were, actually. Back to a better baseline. Yeah, that's great. And with the lung volume reduction, they're in for? They're in for oh. longer. Um, yeah. I tend to wait until, they may have one or two drains in, so I wait till one drain is in. So realistically, uh, it's it's a tougher operation to get through, so mm -hmm. you're talking five to seven days. Excellent. Okay. But I will only let people home if I feel that they're you know obviously on the bike, they're dressing, they're showering, they're managing the stairs, the bowels are working, the pain is well managed, that they're happy to go, and that mm -hmm. their family are happy to take them. Yeah. You know that they're ready. They yeah, have to be ready good. psychologically as well as clinically. Great. Um, any questions from the floor there? Yeah, just hold on for the mic, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Edmund. Thank you. What proportion of your patients are having valves and what proportion of the patients are having lung volume reduction? For the people who come to me, I would say um, roughly about 50 to 60 percent of them are suitable for valves. Um, some I will send straight to transplant for different reasons, uh, and then the rest will be robotic lung volume reduction. There's a small group of people who get valves in and they get a really good valve effect, but then they lose it. Maybe there's a pinhole of an opening in the fissure. Uh, and I'm keen to do those surgically afterwards. I'll take the valves out and offer them surgical lung volume reduction because I know that they're going to get the benefit that they hope for. Excellent. Any other questions? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, just when these people are discharged, what if you know, they're usually discharged with go to your GP if you have a problem. What sort of things should we look out for in the first week or two? And <coughs> secondly, if they have a problem, can they go back in overnight or do they have to wait until the next morning to go back in? They tend to call me directly. I suppose that's the service that we offer. Um, or they'll call, you know, the Stokes Ward, uh, where all my patients go to directly. Or if they come through to ED, we'll manage them. Um, we tend to give them uh, five days of prednisolone 20 milligrams along with, uh, I give them antibiotics Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the acithromycin cocktail, uh, and I keep them on some Expitex, so that uh, if they do produce a little bit of phlegm in response to the valves going in, that they can manage it, and you'll find that they have a better cough mechanism so they can get it up. So I, I would rarely have a readmission rate, I have to say, following valves, um, but it's something that we'd be mindful of, and uh, we're there for them. That's great. One more. Can I just ask about the longer term outlook for these patients after mm -hmm. surgery? Um, you know, how long is, is the benefit maintained? Yeah, we've, um, the Pulmonex group have looked at one, three, and five years and compared them to, I suppose, medical therapy. So from a mortality rate point of view, if you look at, their, at a similar cohort, um, the, the, the risk of death uh, is reduced uh, by half, you know? And that in itself obviously is important, but we haven't looked enough around the economic burden around attending GPs and going back into ED in the middle of the night, um, or the quality of life. So we know the quality of life is, is better um, all around. Um, traditionally, I would have said that you get a lasting alveolar effect from about three to five years, where people used to have one side done, and then they would come back three to five years later and maybe have the other side done. Um, if, if there's a suitable target. Um, I find at the moment of patients, they get such a response and they know that maybe the other side could be done. But they're coming back to me because now they want more because they want to do more. So they're going, oh, I'm, you know, kicking the ball around with my grandchild now, but I'd like to, to walk the hill of hope or whatever. So, um, but the, for me, sometimes I look at them depending on their age about whether they're ever going to get to being a lung transplant recipient. Uh, and we're probably doing about 45 to 50 lung transplants a year uh, if we have enough resources in place. Um, so sometimes I might see them and say, I'm going to valve one side, 
what happens is the other side will hyper hyperinflate over time. And actually, that the hemithorax on that side gets bigger. But I'm thinking that's not necessarily a bad thing, because if they do go for a single lung transplant, I can get a bigger lung in when the time comes. So technically, there are a couple of things that I think about. And if somebody is in their 50s, like this lady, I don't want to go near her for a transplant until she's 70. I want to give her not just quality of life, but longevity. Uh, or if somebody's 70 coming to me, I might be thinking slightly different because the oldest person we've transplanted is 75, 76. No, thank you very much, uh, Professor Leonard. Any other questions? So we um, move on to Dr. Ambrose. Uh, thank you. Okay, that's it. Great. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Nicola Ambrose. She's a consultant rheumatologist, um, and she has a special interest in adolescent and uh, young adult rheumatology. She also provides uh, an excellent general physician service down in Blackrock, which is um, uh, always very handy for us general practitioners. Um, she is going to speak today about uh, bone health, and there has been um, a, a, a recent development in Blackrock where there's been a bone health clinic set up which um, comprises physiotherapy, uh, dietitian, um, and the rheumatology service. So patients can be referred in from um, our side, they'll be triaged as to what aspects of that is necessary, and um, there's you know, good insurance cover, so it's actually s it works out very reasonable for um, patients to have access to you know, up to six physiotherapy sessions and two dietitian sessions. So it's, it's a really uh, you know, one of a kind in terms of the service. So I'll let uh, Dr. Ambrose go ahead with her talk today. Uh, thank you thanks. very much, um, <coughs> and thanks for inviting me along today. Um, so this is probably a little less of an exciting talk than what we've just listened to, um, but a very, very important talk, I think, I hope you'll agree with, of, of something very basic that I think we could be doing even better. Um, so it's really an update on osteoporosis, um, and I'm just going to... Uh, tell you who I am first of all. So Nikki Ambrose. Um, I'm a rheumatologist at the Black Rock Clinic. I moved home from the UK just over a year ago. Um, and I was doing lovely specialist clinics over in the UK. It was a lovely job, but eventually the lovely job in the wrong country. So I was ready to move home. Um, something that the UK do very well is a systems-based approach whereby um, there is access and protocols and systems in place so that most patients get a basic level of care. Um, there's plenty of things the UK don't do as well as we do here in, in Ireland, but one thing they do very well is protocols and systems. Um, about at least 40% of, of health trusts in the UK over the last couple of years have set up a fracture liaison service or a dedicated bone health clinic as evidence emerges that that's the optimal way to deal with bone health. And when I came home, I saw an opportunity with the proactive approach taken by, by the team at BlackRock um, to set up a similar service here in Ireland. Currently, very few hospitals offer kind of a, a well thought through efficient bone health service. So I'm going to tell you a little bit um, about, about a few things today. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about how we're currently doing about osteoporosis. Um, a little bit about who we should be screening, who we should be treating, and, and a few take-home points, I hope, about how we should be treating. Um, and then just a couple of sentences about what we're doing currently to try to, to develop things at BlackRock. So how are we doing with osteoporosis treatment? So there has been quite a proactive approach towards osteoporosis treatment over the last 15, 20 years. And overall, what we see on big studies at national studies um, out of most countries is that the incidence of hip fractures in elderly population is, is slowly falling. So the drugs do work, and there's lots of room for improvement. Um, but what we are seeing overall is actually a good news picture that with all these things we're doing, when we screen, when we instigate treatments, the instance of hip fractures does decline. Unfortunately, that's being counterbalanced, I guess, or, or defeated by the fact that our population are aging. So despite the fact that the incidence per 100,000 is, is, is reducing, overall our population are aging, and therefore all, overall the, the, the 
the numbers of hip fractures we're expecting to see over the twen next 20 years, as the Irish Times put it, is a time bomb. So it's something that I think we should be proactively looking um, looking at and addressing and seeing what else we can do to try to reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with hip fractures. Something very interesting that's been seen in the UK and I think will be mirrored throughout um, is actually over the last number of years people have relaxed a little bit about screening for osteoporosis and treating it and we're seeing that whereas before there was a reduction in the numbers of hip fractures year on year this is actually plateauing now, and we're missing an opportunity to have prevented quite a lot of hip fractures. And we'll see, per percentage of women of, of the age that should be screened, we were becoming better and better at screening, better and better at screening with DEXA scans, but this has fallen away. And we were getting better at diagnosing, and again, this has fallen away. And it's felt to be multifactorial. Um, one of the things that is against osteoporosis management is the amount of negative media attention that the treatments get. Um, and I think very frequently I'm getting referred in patients who are quite standard patients who would clearly benefit from bone health treatment, but they are absolutely petrified of having osteonecrosis of the jaw or having an atypical femoral fracture because when you look up osteoporosis, what comes first, second and third on your searches is all the, the unusual complications that can arise in patients on treatments. Um, but what we're failing to address is that hip fractures themselves are a terrible thing for your health. Um, so again, different studies show different rates, but overall about 20% one-year mortality, all-cause mortality within a year of having a hip fracture. These are a frail population. They're an elderly population, and quite often they have just about been manage managing to stay at home, and the hip fracture is what leads to their hospitalization. Even those who survive that may end up with permanent disability. It's quite often the reason that people end up in nursing homes. It is quite often that life-changing event where people lose their independence, gain disability, and, and, and don't make it home to their own house independently again. So there is a huge, huge need to try to do what we can to reduce the amount of patients who this is what leaves them, loses their independence for them. So what we see roughly is about 20% death within a year, 30% permanent disability, 40% unable to walk fully independently, and 80% who have lost at least one ADL activity of daily living. So the, num the mortality and the morbidity after a hip fracture is incredibly significant, and even with best care in great centers continues to be very significant, which really reflects that quite often these patients having these osteoporotic hip fractures are on the cusp where frailty is presenting. So what can we do to prevent frailty, to reduce their chances of this event? Um, and I think the more proactive we can be, the better really for our, for our aging population. So we all know that women who are over 65 uh, should be screened with DEXA scans and, and, and should, should have a chat about the pros and cons of treatment if, if low bin, bone mineral density is identified. We're usually pretty good at screening this top line um, of the population. So women aged 65, generally, they're quite often used to having cervical screening, then breast cancer screening, and they head into the osteoporosis screening. This is a group of patients we tend to be relatively good at capturing. Where we're less amazing at capturing are some other patients, because we're all incredibly busy and overstretched in our clinics, and we sometimes don't stop to think about bone health in, in some other groups of patients. Um, younger perimenopausal or postmenopausal women who have had fractures, who are very thin, whose mother may have had a hip fracture, who have um, you know other risk factors for osteoporosis certainly should be offered screening earlier. Um, something that really doesn't happen is all the international and national bodies tell us that we should be screening men from 70 up. And I think we're probably not routinely offering the service to men. And in fact, even younger men with risk factors Adults who have had frailty fractures, by which I mean they've sustained a fracture from a standing height, not falling from a balcony or being in a collision or anything like that. Um, and there's a huge amount of adults who have other chronic conditions um, that are on medications or the condition themselves that lead them to have low bone mineral density. 
Um, and obviously, we do DEXs also to monitor, uh, monitor response to treatment. Those with risk factors. So, for example, in the last week, people I've seen on the ward um, as consults who, who have been in under the orthopedic guise with fractures, um, I have seen two patients with long-standing COPD, relevant to our last talk, um, both maintained on a minimum of five milligrams of prednisolone, but would have obviously, over the years, had much higher doses pretty frequently, um, both with very advanced osteoporosis with multiple vertebral compression fractures, which is now what's delaying their mobility, their rehab, and their discharge. Um, we see lots of polymyalgia, lupus, rheumatoid patients being maintained on low levels of steroids. Um, other conditions sometimes that we don't think as much about, like epilepsy patients, their medications directly can cause osteoporosis. 